This is the second in a series of sermons uh, I'm going to preach entitled uh, Seven Sermons I Wish I'd Preached Years Ago. Um, you know, I either stumbled onto something I should do or should have avoided a few a while back and said that, and I received so many emails saying, well, we'd like to hear those, that I decided I would do it. And last Sunday, I inten unintentionally preached the first one, the difference between tolerance and acceptance, as it related specifically to our congregation considering officially becoming open and affirming of LBGTQ people, which it seems to me in so many ways we already are. Nonetheless, having opened the door, I'm going to continue on, and this will be the second in that series. And this is, uh, focuses on the differences between fact and truth, okay? Fact and truth, which you might summarize by saying, yes, but. Yes, but. May the words, pray with me, may the words of my mouth and the meditations and reflections of everyone here be open and accepting to you, you who are our rock and our salvation. Amen. I have heard, read, and probably preached on the story of the Good Samaritan hundreds of times from from little on, I've heard the story of the man being beaten, thrown at the side of the road, and those who helped him and those who didn't. And I suspect that if you have been connected in any way to a church, the story is probably familiar to you as well. In reply to the question of who is my neighbor, Jesus doesn't get out an outline or a checklist. He, he doesn't begin to preach. He simply tells a story. A story that um, he thinks speaks on its own. It is about uh, an individual who is uh, making the trek from Jeru uh, Jericho to Jerusalem. And the road from Jericho to Jerusalem today, even though it's four lane now, you can see how, how frightening it must have been, how, how dangerous in many ways. It was narrow, it was winding, it was between all kinds of hills in the desert. If you are traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's downhill, but if you're going from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's all uphill. And remember, Jericho is the lowest, at the lowest place in the face of the earth. So, you know, you have at least a 700 foot climb if you travel that road in the heat of the day or whatever else. It is the perfect terrain to work if you are a robber or a thief because there are many places to hide. And in Jesus' story, he talks about this person making this trip from Jericho to Jerusalem and the man along the way somewhere is mugged, he is robbed, he is beaten, he is thrown to the side of the road and left to die. Well, two potential aides, two EMTs pass by. They are religious leaders who could have helped. They could have stopped. They could have done whatever they could. They could have at least sent back word, right, for someone to pick him up, but they didn't. Instead, they kept walking. Maybe they did so because they had to get to work, and maybe they didn't stop because they were afraid the same thing might happen to them. We don't know. We just know they kept going. But then Jesus tells us that a third individual came upon the bloody vict victim, and he stops, and he does what he can, and even more. Now, here's the catch of the story, the exclamation point, the uh, verse that we must pay attention to. The man who helped is a Samaritan. And Samaritans in that day were a tribe that was hated and despised by Jews. They were half-breeds. They worshipped in the wrong place. They didn't even use the right scriptures according to traditional use. They were labeled because of all these deeds as unclean. 
You don't talk to them, you don't go near them, you don't even walk on their land. This was the law that upheld Jewish religious law and practice. Okay? That's a fact. Now, Jesus doesn't elaborate on his story's uh, anti-hero hero, but he allows the story, or at least this part of his story, to drive the message home. He is relying not necessarily on fact, but on truth. There is truth here that supersedes all the other detours that you could take if you're one of those people who wants to base everything on the facts you know. But remember, facts change all the time. Facts are usually seldom final. And as his response to the question that initiated this whole discussion, that is, who is my neighbor? He just kind of left that story hang. He left it hang and placed the responsibility of finding the truth of the tale on the conscience of everyone who had been listening. Because if you heard that st story and you were Jewish at that time, you would be shocked, probably. It would, it would challenge everything you had been told up to that point. If you were a Gentile, you might have quietly said to yourself, hooray. But that's the story. The story hangs. <laughs> It is not dependent on this or that, what time of day it was, any other facts you might get. There is a truth there for us, the hearers, to seek out. So with that in mind, I want to tell you another story. This story finds its context in a rural community, a farming community. Let's place it sometime in the 80s. The story involves a, a young man around, let's say, 30, and his minister, who is approximately the same age. The young man is the apple of his parents' eyes. The other siblings in that family just cannot, you know, they, they just are second to this older young man, to the parents. He was an achiever. He was a respected member of, the, of society, of the community. He was a who's who of the Lions Club or whatever of the time. From early on, he had learned and mastered his trade, which filled a niche in agricultural work. Financially, he was a success way beyond his years. He was the envy of many others his age. There was just one aspect of his life that never fell in place, his dating life. You see, he was a handsome, winsome, he was what anybody would say, that guy's a catch. And he was never lacking in females seeking his time and attention. But over the years, I was, or over the years he was involved in the church there, his relationships never seemed to work out. He'd come close to the altar at times, but then there was always something. And his parents tried to encourage him. You know, his parents said, don't be afraid, don't be afraid of the commitment. It can work, it will work. But their encouragement really became pressure, pressure placed on him. You know, they wanted him to get on, get married, have kids, etc., etc., and it didn't help. So, being the sensible person he was, he engaged a counselor to kind of openly discuss what was going on in his mind. Now we go to the second character. The second character in this narrative is a young minister, one who is close to the family as well as this individual and aware of all that is going on. The minister has done his or her best to help the individual and pastor to the family. But at this, at this point in time, uh, the minister is at a loss as to the next step, what more could be done. Then late one 
Friday afternoon, late in the afternoon, at the end of the day, while in his office wrapping things up on his sermon, he's way ahead of me, I usually do that Sunday morning, right? (laughs) True story. It's late Friday afternoon, he says, says to himself, uh, you know, something goes on in his mind, and he says, I wonder if he's gay. You know, it would make sense given all the failed relationships, and especially given the general uh, negative feelings of people in the community he lived in at that time. You know, this is the 80s. People at that time in small rural communities who came out usually moved to the larger cities nearby. And regarding the minister and his next steps, you know, you don't just walk up to someone and say, hey, you know, I was thinking the other day you might be gay. Are you? And that doesn't work so well, and it's very inappropriate. So the minister called this person's counselor, and by that time the counselor was gone. He was gone for the weekend, and the office was closed. So the minister left a message inquiring of the counselor, have you ever broached the subject or had reason to even consider the subject that this young man is gay? Minister left the message, and that being done went home to his easy life and his family. You know, after all, it's Friday, go home, do what you have. You got Sunday morning all wrapped up. Monday would be another day to pick things up and move on. The only thing was, that Friday evening, the young man took a gun, went to bed, and shot himself. I tell you this story because though it happened nearly 40 years ago. It is a part of my ministry that still haunts me. It probably will forever. I feel that young man's blood. You know, and oftentimes you say to yourself, what what else could I have done? Why hadn't I acted sooner? Why hadn't I, was I so blind and so naive or didn't want to even think about it? Why hadn't I gotten it sooner? I will never know if my conclusions, my suspicions were accurate, but I am convinced that they were. And I think to myself, you know, what a pity, what a shame. A person identified by most people as productive and good and benefit to the community, et cetera, et cetera, pushed to the point they were so excluded that they took their life. They saw no way forward. And I say that if I could go back in time and change things, I would. Which is how it related to me this week as I read, and I'd never thought of this before, as I read for the hundredth and et cetera time, the story of the Good Samaritan and the beaten, the beaten man, I wonder if it wasn't possible that the two people who passed by and didn't stop on their way to Jerusalem, I wonder if they got about a half mile further and thought maybe I should go back. How would things be different if I went back? I'd like to think maybe they wish they had done differently and gone back. You see, they never know the outcome of that either. They never know if the man lived or died, and instead, um, maybe they didn't, but I would like to think that it was a haunting reality that they carried with them too. You know, there's a lot of facts in this story as you jump on, but the truth is, could any, anyone warrant, could, could there be anything in life that warrants doing nothing? Could any law or personal belief justify 
thinking we have the right to say, well, that person's unclean, I'm not gonna touch them, I'm not gonna go near them, I'm not gonna help them, and that makes me better. Because of what their society thought and religious leaders at that time taught and still do today, you know, social norms and opinions were deemed more important than an individual's life. That's what it boiled down to. A life, a Samaritan life that was already pre predetermined to be of less value than another life and not worth the time of day. And they justified that and based it on the scripture and the belief system they had established to back them up. That's a fact. But the question remaining is, did they do the right thing? And that's where truth lies. You know, that's where the yes, but thing is. Yes, I believe that, but... Yes, I think that, but... Jesus left the story hang and let those listening to him think about, do they accept what was done as a truly moral act? You know, who was the one that did the moral thing here? And to ask of ourselves, are our subjective opinions of greater value than someone's life? And leaping from past context to today, do we arrive at similar judgments in similar ways? And shouldn't the church, of all the institutions in society, shouldn't the church be the place where people can know they can come and talk through and deal with such int intimate matters, not being afraid? Not being afraid. Paul says that the church is to be the place where we laugh and cry together. He doesn't say judge and shun. He says we laugh and cry together. The place where we can be vulnerable. The place where people will love us despite everything they know about us. The place where people accept us for who we are, not who they think we should be. You know? I like cherry chip cake. Anybody else here had cherry chip cake? Got it for my birthday. <laughs> What's that? Do you like cherry chip? Like you like cake, period. <laughs> Good for you. Nobody else here likes cherry chip cake? My daughter. She's going to stand up for me. I don't know why you don't like cherry chip cake. And I do. It's just the truth. It's just the way it is. You see, this is the question at hand as we think about this open and affirming thing. You know, in the weeks ahead, the time ahead, and we hope that, you know, we are a trusting enough community that we can talk and share. In the weeks ahead, Garamo and I are going to address, you know, scripture that you may have questions about or have been told different things about. You know, there are six scriptures in the whole Bible that deal with GLBTQ. Think of all the other things that talk about all other things. Uh, six scripture and none of them were spoken by Jesus. We'll talk about those. And unfortunately, those scriptures are superficially interpreted in youth, I think, uh, to justify the church turning people away. And I invite you to revisit and to rethink things if you need to, because, you know, if we're on that road to Jerusalem, maybe we need to think about turning back and re-examining and do what we can to help. Jesus once said to people, you have heard it said of all, but I tell you. Remember, and this is the person who said, I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. In the commandments, he said, you have heard it told of old this, but I tell you something else. 
Our faith should be of seeking to love all. Our church should be a place that accepts that responsibility. Why? Because you just never know whose life you might save. So in response to the question asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? Maybe, maybe that's a question we should answer. Who is my neighbor? Jesus' reply was, cl was quick, clear, and concise. Everyone. Everyone. Amen. <laughs>